Jesus is a perfect, he's got a five on the happy scale and a five on the righteous scale. And uh, yeah, he's perfect. He's perfect. And so that this would be God as well, the most joyous being in the, in the universe and outside the universe, I should say, as far as he's full of joy and he's full of holiness. And, and this is the way for the church when we're going forward. We need to continue to keep our joy. Danny will talk about to keep our love on while we still hold to true objective truth that there's a real righteousness yes. that must be fought for, must be articulated and put yeah. forward. Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Good. Beautiful. I'm, I'm Dan. I'm the lead pastor here at Bethel Church. And it's good to see all of you, online family. Great to have you with us as well. We have a fabulous Holy Week coming up, and you heard about it in the church news. Just real quickly, uh, if, you, if you got a chance to come and pray in this room from 7.30 to 8.30 during the fast, it was a beautiful time. There's like 350 to 400 of us in here, standing room only. So we thought, uh, and many of you said, can we keep doing this? And we couldn't, but we can do it again. <laughs> we can do it again. So um, we'd love for you to come that Monday through Friday and just celebrate with us 7.30 to 8.30 in here. And then our worship rooms will be ministering in here from eight to nine. You can just steal away. We're trying to create space and for you to you know, come and just be with the people of God and together just contemplate the glorious nature of Christ's death and resurrection and his sacrifice on our behalf. And so um, welcome and would love for you guys to come. And as mentioned, if, you've got, uh, if, you, if you don't have kids, maybe come to that eight o'clock service. Uh, for on Good Friday, and then let's have the, maybe the, the kids at the, uh, at the four and the six o'clock service. We'd love for you guys to come in during Good Friday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, the Sunday I often forget about, but we're not forgetting about this time. <laughs> um, Palm Sunday's always struck me weird as a kid, because even somewhere, and I'm talking kid, 11, 12, 13, it was weird because the people would be super happy and celebrating, but even as like a, I don't know, 12, 11, 13 year old, I thought, Aren't these the same people that shouted crucify him about four days later? And so there's always been this little moment of dissonance for Palm Sunday for me, where kind of the human heart is revealed, where you're like, we are, we receive you, we see you. And just so you know that Palm Sunday is this idea Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem and Jerusalem kind of received him as their Messiah and as their King. They understood the the messianic implications of the prophetic signs that were going on. And so that's on Sunday. They're so excited. But then by Thursday and by Friday night, when, when Pilate says, who would you have me release to you? Jesus or Barabbas, the crowd shouts, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And just that, the duplicity of the human heart, you know, we are with you on Sunday by you know, five days later, like give us the criminal, give us the other guy. Palm Sunday, so it's a day of that triumphal entry, and yet, even there, it's that bittersweet walk to the cross that starts on, on that day. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the entering into the joy of our Heavenly Father, and I'm, I'm just, my, my heart is, well, my, my desire is that you realize you and I need to become like God. And again, we're not going to become God's. That would be heresy, uh, but we can become like him uh, in, his, in his character and in the things that he cares about. And at, towards, at the end of the message, I'm just going to take you through the prodigal son story again. And only this time I want you to be thinking about, I'm supposed to be like this guy, the dad, the joyful dad. And so we're going to like leave aside the little brother and the older brother a little bit and just be focusing on the father's amazing navigating of this story and how we're supposed to become like him. Let me show you that scripture, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, um, 3, verse 18. Paul has just been speaking um, about how people that don't recognize that Jesus is God's Messiah. In other words, he's God's anointed king to save the world. He's the Lord of the world. If he, Paul says, people that don't recognize that, they read the Old Testament with a veil over their heart. They kind of don't get it. They don't get the depth of what's happened here. And he's kind of saying they can't quite understand the Old Testament if they fail to receive Jesus as Messiah. So, oops, I turned to Luke where the prodigal son story is. I'm getting there. There we go. So when he says, we with unveiled faces, in this passage I'm about to read to you, he's kind of saying, hey, we have actually received the revelation that Jesus is the king of the whole earth, 
that he is God's anointed Messiah to save humanity. And so in verse 18, he starts, and we who with unveiled faces, that's us who have received Christ, we with unveiled faces all reflect or contemplate, could be either word, the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. So here's you and I, and we are being transformed into God's likeness. That is a pretty high bar right there, right? So like, I just want to get a little better, Dan. I'm like, I do too. I want you to get a little better. But the Lord wants you to become like him and wants you and I to become like him. So there's this beckoning in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, to continue to become more and more like the Father. So there's so many things to say about God. I just thought, I'm just going to focus on this beautiful imagery of the Father and the, the joyous Father that you see in, um, in the prodigal son, his capacity to, to celebrate, his capacity to correct, his capacity to, you know, to woo and not dominate. So we're going to take a little bit of time looking through that and just appreciating, okay, that's how, that's how God treats other folks. That's probably how I should be treating the significant people in my life as well. Before I get there, I want to talk to you about just this idea that God is our Father. Most of you have been through Deeper Life class, looks like to me. Uh, <laughs> It's the class of membership I teach like, you know, 50 Sundays a day or Connie and, uh, and Aaron teach it. And um, we, we talked about how this revelation that God is, is humanity's father was one of the primary revelations of Jesus. He didn't talk a lot. He talked some about his death and resurrection. He talked a lot about God being dad. This was my father knows, my father, he, he just was talking over and over again, trying to bring, help, bring Yahweh of the Old Testament Bring home the revelation. He's not really far away, really hard to know, and really hard to please, but he's actually close and nearby, that he's, he's our father. So, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to you about how God's everybody's father, but he's not everybody's father, right? How many remember that message? It changed your life, I'm sure. The, uh, <laughs> and it's that provocative thing in scripture that like it says he's everybody's dad, clearly, and yet it says he's not everybody's dad in other ways. And I just briefly want to just... Uh, review that with you, that scripture teaches that God's everybody's father in the sense that we, we get our identity from him. Our origin is from him. We are made in his image. So that's absolutely intact. Believer and not believer, made in his image. The second part is that God has an attentive sort of love. It, that beautiful scripture says, I know the numbers of hairs on your head and, um, and, and that I know what you need before you ask it is both the believers and unbelievers just talking about how God hasn't forgotten anybody but is attentive to them. And then he's everybody's dad in the sense that he has given grace to respond to the call to come home. That scripture uh, says where sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. His undeserved love and his power to transform abounds even more. So he's everybody's dad in identity, in his attentiveness and affection, his love, in the, that he gives everyone grace to come home. And then also, and this is clearly in the story of the prodigal son, he's everybody's dad in the sense he wants all the kids to come home. And as we read that story, we get this idea that God is longing for the runaways to come home. He's longing for the rebels to come home. So he's everybody's dad in that section, in that sense. But scripture says he's not everybody's dad in another sense. And we talked about scriptures that to those who believe and receive, he's given the right to be called children of God. And that through, we actually get this right through trusting in him. And we talked about the three things. So in addition to the four things I mentioned, those of us who have trusted him as our father um, have said, I want to receive new life in Christ through his death and resurrection. We get the, we get the bonuses of intimacy with God. We actually know he's dad and we can talk to him like he's dad. Hey, dad, this really hurt. This confused me. Dad, this didn't work out the way I want to. Dad, I broke this thing. Could you help me fix it? I, I broke this relationship. Can you help me? Can you help me? So we get intimacy with the Lord and that intimacy looks like ongoing help and conversation. It also looks like I know who to be grateful to. I know when a blessing comes my way, I actually know this blessing came from you. Um, so, so that's part of this, what we get in our intimacy, this dependence we have on the Lord, where we get to go to him and stay dependent. I'll talk more about that in just a, a little bit. And so we have intimacy, 
And then we also have a hope when he's our dad, a hope for this life and the next. We don't have to be afraid of death in this life or the next, but we're able to know, hey, death's not an end for me. It is a doorway to, to life with God. And the last part about being a father is this inheritance, that he is like, he is our inheritance and life with him in the next life is something he's looking forward to. He went to great lengths to bring us into the family and to create an inheritance. So you got all that, everyone? You ready for quiz? No, I'm not going to quiz you. You're good. Love that. But you, um, you get it. Intimacy, hope, and inheritance kind of comes with being in part of God's family or him being our father. So this idea of being a father has been a powerful and beautiful gift to me. I remember when I first had kids, I was like, oh, this is how much you love us. Oh, this is crazy. This is crazy. I mean, when you think about how, you know, you were before you had kids and then the love that was birthed in your heart for your kids, how, you know, you do anything for them, them driving around in cars, like, like adults drives you nuts. I mean, it's like, huh? Jesus, keep them safe. Angels, so that, that, that deep affection for your kids. I mean, I remember that just blossomed for me. I'm like, oh, you love us this much. That's, that's, a, that's amazing. It's almost like a whole nother bit of revelation for me. So many great revelations came from knowing God as my father. I actually love to teach on. It's one of my primary things I love to teach on. But for you, for you and me, as I'm getting to this age, I'm going to talk to you folks that are a little older, my age and older. I'm 58. So let's talk about this right now. This is important in Bible. Whenever you're doing Bible study, metaphors and word pictures work until they don't. <laughs> they, they work for a bit and then that stopped working. So you're like, the Lord's my shepherd. Uh, you know, that, that makes me, okay, that, that's awesome, but that makes me a dumb sheep uh, that I, you know, I'm gonna run off a cliff. I always hear stories like that. So I'm a dumb sheep. And like, no, 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 that metaphor broke down for you. The Lord's your shepherd's beautiful. When you go, I'm a dumb sheep uh, who doesn't know any better, I think, I think maybe took the metaphor too far in that particular one. But this idea of God as father, remember, we're gonna get to this, we're becoming like him. And he's this joyful father as we kind of talk through the story of the prodigal son. I, I, at this stage of my life, I am discovering some things about fathering that don't help me understand who God is, but actually work against who God is. And uh, the, the first one is that my kids need me less. And I don't think I love it. <laughs> I mean, they have more independence and they're, other, they're talking about going to college, whatever that is. I mean, like leaving the environment. They are, um, you know, it's like, what time you back? You know, uh, you know, I'll be back then. Okay. You know, and it's just Christy and I, and there's no kids in the house because they're off doing their cool kid stuff. I know what it is, by the way. They're good kids. But the, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're out there. And it's just a weird deal to not be like the center of the kids anymore. It's just like a weird deal. It gets weirder thinking about there'll be a day when they're not at my Thanksgiving table. I'm at their Thanksgiving table. <laughs> That sounds horrific. I'm going, to have a, I'm going to have a tough time being thankful for that in, in, in that moment. I'll just sit there and just, I know it's the circle of life or whatever else, but that idea of like, where the kids don't need me as much and where they're, they're getting more and more independent. And that's what I want. I, I'm supposed to launch them. They're supposed to become and have their own families. It's beautiful-ish. Uh, I, but I, I know. <laughs> But I'm grieving the lack of, you know, deep intimacy and ongoing intimacy is that, you know, you look at the future and your kids may be all over the United States and various things like, that's not as great. Like there's a, a part of fathering that actually disassembles or hurts my actually, my, my, my connection with God as father. In other words, because it's not our job to ever get distant from the Lord and be launched from the Lord's presence. I'm not supposed to ever leave his house again. And I'm not supposed to be able to set up my kind of my own kingdom where I'm the center of it, and, but rather I, he stays the center of my, my kingdom. And so metaphors, God as father works until it doesn't. Uh, here, another one is my, just my dad, as he aged, suddenly I, you know, I went from leaning on my dad to him leaning on me. And I, instead of him fixing stuff at my house, I went to his house and fixed stuff. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it's like, wow, this is very different stage in fathering, very different reality. And then, and then you know, be his death and at the time, you know, and his death is like, okay, this is having your dad pass away is, this is not something that's in my fathering, God's fathering of me. In other words, I'm, his fathering of me will never look like he dies. 
It'll never look like I take care of him. It'll always look like he's eternal and he's taking care of me. And so fathering's a gorgeous metaphor and word picture until it stops being a gorgeous metaphor. Most recently, I had the privilege and this kind of sacred privilege of uh, having a power of attorney for a family member. And that's, that's a whole other deal. It's where you have responsibility for somebody's end of life directives and you have the responsibility for uh, the, their finances and as they get less and less able to manage their finances. And so um, being in that role was this, this very surreal kind of crazy moment where somebody's like looking at you like, I, I'm gonna trust my worldly wealth to you to take care of me. And it was surreal for them, it was surreal and weird for me. The, the weirder part for me is that I, I thought, in 20 to 30 years, I'm going to be sitting in that chair, and my kids are going to be sitting in this chair, talking about these ideas of powers of attorney and you know, ongoing care. So, oof. <laughs> my point is that this, we're going to talk about God fathering, but I... I just want you to know, I think fathering is a dominant, gorgeous metaphor. But us older saints, I think we have to be cautious that some new reality of what being an earthly dad looks like doesn't like sneak in and color our connection with our heavenly father. That's good, dad. He's not going to die. He's not going anywhere. We're not being launched out of his house. Uh, we're not going to be taking care of him. But that we can have this expectation of, of intimacy, hope, and inheritance Intimacy, conversation, help, all the rest of our days. And so with that rehabilitated, fresh look at fathering of what it doesn't contain, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, turn our attention to this idea of God as this, this joyful father in the prodigal son story. So on Mother's Day, I got to preach. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, frankly. I don't know if all our women uh, preachers were not there or they're like, I'm not working that day. It's Mother's Day. So uh, I'm not sure what happened, but I, I ended up preaching and I remember kind of getting it like, oh, okay, this is now mine. So, uh, but I talked to you about some of the things I think about with, with raising kids. And so I gave you like a bit of art, a bit of um, incredibly gorgeous graphic art to talk about raising our kids. And so sound team, production team, if you could put that up there. I know this changed your life. You've probably never forgotten it. There it is. So, yeah. All right. So if you haven't seen this before, <laughs> it's this idea that God is our heavenly father who never dies and never, you know, never, we never need to take care of. He's our heavenly father and he's raising earthly kids. He's raising you and I to be like him and he's actually trying to raise kids that are both happy and righteous. He's trying to raise kids that are happy and righteous. So we talked about if you are raising a kid who's a five on the happy scale, but a one on the righteous scale, that's a big bummer. That's a, that's a big old bummer that, you, you know, it's like with me, my kid is super self-absorbed. His own happiness is the center of the universe for him. And so if he's got no righteousness, but high happy, we're, we're heading to like pathological unhealth right there at that particular point. At least not a good solid citizen or a good solid husband or wife at that point. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I mean, if your spouse is like, hey, I'm high happy and low righteous, that's a tough go for your, for your spouse. A really tough go for your spouse. But the same thing is true too. If you got um, somebody who is like, you've got a kid who's like, I'm super good at keeping the rules, but I have no joy in them. I don't know why I'm keeping them. I'm just trying to avoid trouble and, you know, you know, and stay, stay out of difficulty and stay in your good graces. Well, the Lord's not interested in raising just righteous kids. I mean, the church did that for a while. The church that I, you know, the, the church that was around in the, in, I wasn't around in the 50s or 60s, which I was around in the 60s, but not too, I was, I was tiny, a wee little lad. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. So the, um, I think that was Scottish. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my Irish heritage. Uh, anyway, it's all the same. No, I'm teasing. Irish, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, I got both going on, so I'm all right. I'm all right. I can tease. Okay, so. I tease. People. People seeing green right now. All right, so. Um, so righteous, 
<laughs> well, oh, the church. The church. The church was actually righteous, but wasn't happy. You know, it's like the movie Babette's Feast. You know, where they're 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 living righteous, but there's just no joy in it anywhere at all. And so that's not the Lord's heart either. But see where the cross is. That's Jesus. That's the idea that we're saying there is that Jesus is a perfect. He's got a five on the happy scale and a five on the righteous scale. And uh, yeah, he's perfect. He's perfect. And so that this would be God as well, the most joyous being in the in the universe and outside the universe, I should say, as far as he's full of joy and he's full of holiness. And, and this is the way for the church when we're going forward. We need to continue to keep our joy. Danny will talk about to keep our love on while we still hold to true objective truth that there's a real righteousness yes. that must be fought for, must be articulated and put yeah. forward. So now if we think about the story of the prodigal sons, the prodigal sons, because they were both rebels. One was a rebel in the house. That's right. And one was a rebel outside the house. Um, the one in the house disconnected to the father. So you could probably think, now, where do you think the youngest brother, the youngest son who took off and was, you know, squandering wealth, where, where was he, do you think? He's like a five on the happy. When he finally got the cash, right? He's probably a zero for a bit. I need my cash, dad. Uh, but then finally he goes to a five. So he's a five, but where he's on the righteous scale? Zero. So yeah, we basically have like, an, you know, an, uh, a kid that's full of, fully into himself, but has no righteousness. Where's the older brother on the scale? Five and righteous. Seems to be zero in happiness. You know, here's dancing and music, and his brother's turning. He's like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and so, um, so you've got those, those extremes here. And then I think you've got the father, who I think the father in the story is amazing, navigating this relationship where he's a five on the, on the happy, happy and joyful scale and a five on the righteous scale while navigating these two broken sons. And you and I are supposed to become not like one of the sons, but like the father in the story. So we're supposed to be heading towards that being conformed to the image of Christ and being transformed into his likeness, where both joy and responsibility, uh, happy and holy, are kind of marking us. All right, so you got that? All right, you can take that down then off the screen then for now. Put me back up there. Because some of you like watching the screen more than me, but I'm like, that's how I get it. I do the same thing. It's like TV. Hi, Dan. TV. <laughs> so I'm going to read you the story because I, I, I sometimes assume everybody knows the story, but it's one of the most beautiful parables of Jesus when he's trying to you know, articulate who God is to the lost and again, I think the dominant way to read the parable is, am I the, am I the younger son or am I the older brother? That is the way that I think Jesus originally and mostly meant the parable to be read. Um, but I'm actually asking you to read it thinking, watch the dad, watch him in, uh, there's some places where it's just kind of silent about what he does, uh, but, it, but watch how he responds to situation after situation. Because this place of being um, happy and holy to being joyful and righteousness is, is I think, the state where that's, that's who God is and that's where we're becoming. Partly I'm thinking about this thing because I was reading um, a leadership book and the, the leadership book asked the question, like, how quickly do you return to joy after a setback? And I was like, I didn't know I was supposed to return to joy. <laughs> After so that's a very interesting idea. I think it was Marcus Warner in his book, I think that's his name, in his book, Rare Leadership. But how quickly do you return to joy? I'm like, oh, that, thank you. I don't even need the book now. I just have that idea. But, um, and so then I was thinking, well, how, what does joy look like? And then jo the father's joyful and being in right relationship with the father's joyful. So, so being rightly related to the father is kind of my joy spot. Being rightly related to the Father is a place where I find joy. And being rightly related to other people is also a place where I, I find joy. But that one with the Lord has to be there. So then thinking about how do I snap back into joy got me thinking about how do I, how do I behave like God and become like God, be connected to God and become like God. So in this prodigal son story, I'm reading out of Luke chapter 15, verse 11. I'm reading out of the old school NIV, probably the 1985 edition or something like that. Uh, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one 
hold on. Remember, you're reading for the father. Pay attention to the father in the story. Try to just pay less attention to the sons and all that sort of stuff. Look how the father responds. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And he said to him, Father, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Well, your brother's come, he replied. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he is, has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf and call for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate, but we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Beautiful story. Again, so many things to preach, so many different avenues to, to, to head down. But I want to talk with you about at least four spots. You might be able to find more where the father kind of behaved, I think, in this incredibly mature way. And I would describe that maturity as he was both happy and holy. He was able to not like respond in anger and in like crushing authority in the moment of crisis. So let's take a look at those together real quickly. And as I'm going through this, you're, just to remember, I'm not doing a sermon about how to reach out or how to treat your adult kids who don't know Jesus. That's, I'm, that's not the main dynamic I think this parable is about, and I don't think it's the main dynamic. I know it's not the main dan dynamic I'm trying to get you to see. I'm trying to get you and I to aspire to this level of maturity when things are crazy <laughs> and when things are good. I'm trying to get you and I to aspire to this level of level-headedness and graciousness when in the midst of, when people around you are, as Shaq would say, acting the fool. <laughs> Any basketball players? Okay, so, the, uh, <laughs> that's right. So, um, so that's what I'm trying to, trying to get us to, to kind of embrace and see. And you're going to have to think through with the Lord, if you're thinking sp particularly about one of your own children, Hey, be thinking through some of the things that I say. Like, Lord, is that, a, is that a word to me? Is that what I should do? Should I be doing something different? And Because uh, we'll, we'll unpack this as we go along. But I don't want you to just walk out with a cookie-cutter idea if the Lord hasn't stamped it into your head or your heart. Like, this is the place I am in this, this unreconciled relationship. Does that make sense, everyone? Are you good? Okay. All right. So the first part is that the, the father suffers this, you know, real indignity, this incredible insult, this incredible rejection and where his son basically says, I wish you were dead. I don't care how this looks to you or to the community or to everybody in the house, but I want 
you know, my inheritance. And I think at that time he would have been entitled to a third of it because the older brother usually got, I know it says they divided it. I think they would divide it. The older brother would get the double portion. So two thirds of it, the younger brother would get a third. But there's this, this story, again, that is so beautiful at some level. When you listen as the sinner and his younger brother and you're welcome home, it's beautiful. But the Jews in the days of Jesus would have listened to this and thought, this son is a reprobate. This son is horrible to the community. This son can't be uh, uh, appeased at all. He has to, you've got to put your foot down. The audacity to say, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance while you're still alive. Unheard of. Unheard of in that culture. And so this father, though, in the story of Jesus says, oh, okay. We'll, we'll get on that. And he, again, they don't have cash in the bank, so they are selling property, selling cattle, selling crops in order to uh, get together enough cash so that this young man could put it in his pocket and take it somewhere. And so I, I, if all the times you want to scream, over my dead body are not going to happen, there's this incredible moment when this, the father lets the son have his choice without using kind of his rightful authority to, put, to say not going to happen. No can do. So he allows the son freedom in the moment when that freedom is incredibly costly and incredibly insulting to the father. He, again, we don't see joy, but we don't see anger and explode and power and control in this moment. We actually see a willingness to meet his need and his request. And so kind of the, the point here is the incredible, we're becoming like God God, Jesus says the father's like this, and the father in this parable actually meets this insult with graciousness, with graciousness. It's the same graciousness that the, the Lord Jesus has on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, and they were the same, you know, many of them the same people who were shouting his triumphal entry just five days earlier. That graciousness, that heals a rebel's heart, or at least forgives a rebel, uh, whether or not they come home. So there's another part of God's maturity. If we're going to become like him, this joyous fathering that we see, we see it in his mature waiting, that he waits for the, the um, younger son to come home. It's interesting when you read the parable that in the, it's, a, it's part of a three string, um, three parables in a line. And the first one is about the woman, a woman tearing the house apart to find a coin, one of ten coins she's lost. A beautiful story about how God tears the house apart to find you. And then the next story is about this lost sheep, sheep who's wandered off, um, and the shepherd actually goes and gets the sheep. But in this story, the father doesn't go and get the sheep. It's intriguing. Like in the first two, he goes, and in the next one, he doesn't go. And I do think it's a sign that sometimes p that people are so lost or so incapable that we need to go. And certainly it describes what God has done for us. We were so lost in our sin, so broken. He, had to, he came to us to bring us back to the sheepfold, to put us back in uh, the purse, so to speak. But in this particular one, it, it's, the father doesn't go, he waits. And it's an interesting picture of God letting freedom, letting individual freedom kind of have its work waiting for them to come to their senses. Now, at some point, we know that God's at work. Scripture says where grace abounds, sins abound, uh, where sin abounds. I fixed it. Stop it. I, uh, where sin abounds. Great. People who know their Bible. Uh, so where, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more in Romans chapter 5. And so he's, certainly the Lord is in a different situation in the sense that his grace is with us amongst the pig food, amongst the starving nature. We, we don't kind of come to our senses probably without grace being given to us and apportioned to us like, hey, wake up, Dan, have you seen your situation here? So I do think that, there, that there's, a, there's a picture of grace in the story as well. But there's a mature waiting. Um, the, the Lord's not a, um, not a universalist. He, he's not saying everybody's going to be saved whether they want to or not. Universalism is a denial of God's free will and human free will. And so he has this, his holy um, and, and holy and joyful, his responsible and happy way is to wait for this boy to come home and to let him kind of come to his senses. He didn't go running after him when he was lost this time. 
he does go, he does go find another son later in the story. So it doesn't mean like God never goes because the first two parables show God going. And then the older brother, he actually goes out to him as well. But in this one, he's like, no, no, the son, it's not the right thing for me to go. But then you see his joyful, the, the explosion of his joyful responsibility, his incredible maturity when the boy comes home. And there's this extravagance in that, so that moment, killing a fatted calf. You kind of realize how extravagant it is when the older son says, you never even gave me a goat for me and my friends, you know, to go have a picnic. And you're doing, the, you know, killing the fatted calf. Um, this extravagance, he meets him. Uh, you know, kisses him, has been looking for him a long way off. And so you see this, uh, the mature, uh, you know, his, his, his joyful responsibility, his maturity in the moment of rejection when he doesn't panic and the boy leaves. You see it in when he's waiting for the boy to come to his senses, longing for him to come home, but knowing that the boy has to come home. But then when the boy does come home, you see, oh, the dad's been looking for him regularly for his return over and over again. And it's been, and then I just, in the story, it begs the question, how many times did the dad go, is that him? Is that him? Is that, it's walking like him. No, it's not him. And this, this, this idea that I didn't go, but I'm watching. I'm watching. And so again, as soon as he sees him over the horizon, the, the father runs after him. Uh, when, when I was younger, and actually in this very room, I preached a, the, on this message probably 30 years ago here, 26 years ago. I said, I'm going to do an impersonation of God, an impression of God. You ever seen an impression of God? And the congregation went, <laughs> they weren't, <laughs> they're like, we've heard your Scottish accent that you thought was Irish. Um, <laughs> No, what I did is I jumped off the stage. This wasn't here at the time. It was just the steps so you could kind of get down there. And I just ran as fast as I could to the back of the room. It was impersonating God when he runs to his son and throws his arms around him. Luckily, there was nobody standing back there that I had to kiss and hug at that point. But it's just that, that, that when God sees us a long way off, he takes off running. Takes off running. And so we see his maturity in, in the way he reaches for the boy who has just come home. And then finally, we see the father's joyful maturity when he realizes the older brother isn't around. And it's an interesting story. The older brother hears music and, and dancing, which I was like, my church, when I grew up in, didn't like dancing. It didn't dance, and so I still can't dance to this day. But uh, I always thought, why do you not like dancing when it's in your very favorite parable about dancing from goodness right there? Uh, for goodness sake, it's right there. That's a side note. A little footloose moment. <laughs> I'm kidding. Jesus. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen that movie yet, the whole thing. Anyway, so <laughs> he hears dancing. So he calls out to his servants and then, you know, what's going on? And um, he says, your older, you know, the older, um, your brother's come back. It's interesting, in the, in the older brother seems to know exactly what the younger son's doing. So the dad, they've said he was dead, but now he's alive, he was lost. The older brother actually knew where he was and what he was doing and was resentful of him. So it makes you think the dad knew what he was doing. And was just waiting for him to come home rather than coming to rescue him. So his, he joyfully goes out there. And the older brother, again, we're looking at the father. The father treats his older brother who's pouting, who, done, who is mad about uh, not having stuff that he wouldn't have gotten anyway. Wasn't his inheritance. Who is, you know, is just being resentful. And the, the, the Lord, the, the joyous father this time doesn't wait for the older son to get it together and come in the house because he's hungry but actually goes out to him to reason to him and to, to talk to him about hey you everything I have is yours but he is highlighting you've been in my house but not you haven't been attached to my heart if you haven't been longing for your younger brother to come home then you're in my house but not attached to the heart to the things that I care about so you and I when when Corinthians, 2 Corinthians says we're becoming like him. When scripture says be holy because your father in heaven is holy. Uh, when, it, when it talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, how we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so that we don't get weary in well-doing. For me, this, the beautiful maturity of the father actually working to bring reconciliation without panic and punishment, without knowing the right thing to do at the right time, is a gorgeous picture of how mature you and I are con supposed to continue becoming. That we are in ongoing discipleship. Yeah. Ongoing transformation. And so I, I just encourage you as you read this story again, 
in the future be thinking about the radical love, joy, and responsibility of the Father as he's dealing with very different people in his life. All right? Let me pray for you. And I'm actually going to pray for our missions teams that are out there too. Did we pray for them already? This morning? I know, but in the, in the first service? Oh, in the opening we did. Okay, good. All right, then I'll just give them a little bit of prayer. The, uh, <laughs> but let, let's pray. Let's pray together. Hey, Father, we just declare we are not good enough people to do this. We were not raised well enough. We are not smooth enough. We are, our EQ is not high enough. But you said we're becoming like you. You said that. And we say yes. We say yes to this level of, of maturity, this level of graciousness, this level of joy, this level of responsibility in the midst of rejection, celebration, reconciliation, and, 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 um, and be people's self-importance. We ask that it would be just another facet of how the world comes home to you, Heavenly Father, because they see in us uh, they see in us a glimmer of who you are and how you treat people. We pray, Lord Jesus, that our missions teams all throughout the globe, they would be, make, they would be sending this powerful message of your absolute joy over the lost and your call for them to come home and to be established in your house. We pray the word might powerfully dwell in them, that you would back up their preaching of the gospel with signs and wonders, that radical protection would be their portion, and that you would, um, in, in the midst of difficulty and trial, in those tests, you might give them a testimony, that you might, they might have a breakthrough that actually goes, okay, this is how things work in the kingdom. So we bless our brothers and sisters, especially the leaders out there trying to listen to your Holy Spirit, give them ears to hear, and great wisdom. Uh, to lead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you guys. Great being with you.